Father God, we just come before you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, Father. We thank you for, for your laughing spirit, Father, for your humor, and Lord, just for the things that you do. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would quiet our hearts, Father, and our minds and our souls right now, Father, so that we may hear your voice as it speaks to us today, Father, on balance. Father, we just thank you, Lord, and we love you, Father, and we praise you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray, amen and amen. It's funny because, <clears throat> because the summer's been so screwed up. Um, for those of you that don't know, I drive for a summer camp, and it's really kind of interesting. Um, we, we, we get, we've run into so many different people. I've, I got to spend, oh, about an hour and a half with a, a young lady that was a counselor at our camp. She's probably the only non-Jewish counselor at camp, and she happens to teach social justice. Now, what was really kind of interesting is I got to speak to her. She's a teacher in a Catholic school. And so I got to speak to her on the Bible's social justice because I asked her a question and she said, well, this is what I, what I teach. And I said, but is that grounded in the word of God? And then she asked me a question and it opened the door. And for an hour and a half, we spoke. By the time we were done, she said, you've taught me more than I taught in the four years of school that I went to schooling to learn how to teach the classes that I did. Ne never be afraid to speak the word of God to people, even if they think they know the word of God. Never be afraid to speak the word of God. Um, <clears throat> this morning, I'm going to get to some verses, but I'm going to talk just a little bit. Um, many of you got that piece of paper that I handed out. I ran out, but if, you, if you're sitting next to somebody with with one. We will go over this in a minute. Now, yours doesn't have all the writing that mine has on it. And, and there's a reason. Um, because as we speak about balance, we're going to speak about this. Um, but I first want to start off with this. The word catalyst. Now, catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a reaction. Yesterday, or last Sunday, we, we, we figured out that that the word balance meant having a sound mind. And, and we really need to, to look at that for a minute before we keep going, because having a sound mind becomes the catalyst that creates a reaction, all right? Now, we can use the word response as well. Reaction is one of those things. You have to have an action to have a reaction. So if I'm willing to step out in my faith in the balance of God's word, then I am setting into motion a reaction that is going to come. Now, a catalyst, again, is a substance that increases the rate of reaction without itself undergoing any permanent change. All right, now, here's the thing. The word of God has never changed from Genesis to Revelations. It has always stayed the same, and it always has been the perfect thing for every single situation that has been known to come from man, all right? You have to understand that. If, if, if you need an answer to a situation, the word of God has it, all right? But so many of us look for that answer somewhere else. But the word of God has the absolute correct balanced answer. We're gonna speak about that in a little bit, a little bit more. Now, it also means, or a person or thing that precipitates an event. Now, precipitate in the Greek is katakrimenizo. All right, it means to throw over as in a precipice. Now, you guys have seen that, that picture of man and, and God and how there's this big gap in between us. Now, this, the, the word of God becomes, all right, now, now most things will say it's the cross, and it is a cross, the, the cross of Christ became, became that, that thing that's across the precipice that keeps man separate from God, which is sin. Jesus Christ became that crossing over piece that allows us to go from a sin nature and into the righteousness of Christ. So we look at this, and, and katakrimenizo means 
to throw over as in a precipice. It comes from two words. The first is kata, and it means throughout, daily and day by day. So the word of God, daily, day by day, becomes that thing that keeps us in righteousness with Christ. All right, in righteousness with God. It's always the factor. All right, without, without this, and, and I'm going to be holding this up a lot today, without this, all right, we are separated from God. All right, we need this. We need this. When, when we're not using this and we're trying to live life in our own understanding, it doesn't work. And I'm going I'm to show you something very interesting shortly, and you're going to be shocked when I tell you what this word means. Because there's a word that, that I'm going to use in a little bit that literally means Beelzebub. And it's something that we tend to be in every single day. Now, it's interesting because Thursday night, I think it was Thursday night. Thursday night, I got home from, from one of the runs that we did. Oh, it was a social. And no, it wasn't the social. It was something before that. And uh, I got home, and I'm sitting there going, Lord, I, I have no idea what I'm going to speak on Sunday. I don't, I don't have any kind, of, any kind of message yet. And he goes, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some. Well, at 10 o'clock at night, he decided to give me some. So I'm sitting there doing my thing, getting what we got to get done, and it's just like, whew, and this is the message. And so if, if it doesn't make sense, it's blame God. But, it, but it, should, it should make perfect sense. Now, it also, that word katakremenizo, also comes from kremnos, which means a steep bank. It comes from kremenumai, which means to hang or suspend. It as well means to be hung. Now, as we, as we begin to understand the second part of this series, I want you to understand that there needed to be a catalyst that began the motion of grace, all right? Because what we're talking about today is the balance of grace and truth because there's been this huge injustice of balance of grace and truth. And, and, and what happens is with, without the balance of grace and truth, then we are literally doing a disservice to people, all right? And, and, and we see this on a day-to-day -day basis, the law was based on truth. There was no grace in the law. All right? And so what did the law do? It led people further and further into sin. All right? It took grace to bring people back. Now, let me go on here. So I want you to understand that there needed to be a catalyst that began the motion of grace, and that catalyst was the death and resurrection of Christ. He was going to become the crossing across that precipice that would lead us to eternal life that can only be found in him. Grace is unmerited favor. It means we don't deserve it. Nothing we could ever do would deserve to have the grace of God given to us. There was only one person that could go forward that would give us the grace of God, and that was Jesus Christ. And the only way that he could do that was to sacrifice himself, offer himself up as a sacrifice. We saw what happened in Levitical law. Every time we sinned, we would have to bring something forward, and we would have to kill it. It would have to be bled out a certain way. It would have to be burnt a certain way. It would have to be cut up a certain way. And then it would have to be offered. And then, depending on the sin, it could be anything big or anything small. Depending on the amount of money a person had, it became either big or it became small. All right? So every time sin prevailed, we had to have a sacrifice. So Christ became that crossing, that event, that person, that catalyst that entered into, that allowed us to enter into grace. Do we deserve it? No, we don't. Nobody deserves grace. But we see what happened without it in the Old Testament, the law. And the law created more sin. Why? Because the law was not used to teach. Grace is used to teach. When grace is applied with truth, it becomes 
the, the prevailing factor that allows us to see clearly, not fantasy, but allows us to see clearly the things that need to be seen and can be described. Now, <clears throat> the catalyst of grace plus truth allows a true freedom of Christ to be set into motion. This, this, this piece of paper that I handed out that says hang out, call in, call out, check out, all right? When we look at this in a couple minutes, we're going to have an understanding of what's going on in the world today. We're going to have an understanding of what goes on in churches today. Because, see, without the balance found in grace and truth, we are literally, literally, literally creating a, a fictitious state of mind. That's why it's so important when we looked at the word balance, the first word, the first words that it said was to have a clear mind, a, a, a right mind. Because I'm telling you, today, most people will sit down, watch the news, and they will believe that. They will believe what Google has to say. They will believe what everything has to say, and they take that as valid. But the funny thing is, is when this thing says something, we look at it and go, well, I don't know how true that is. We call this fictional. But I'm going to tell you something. If you go back <coughs> and you look, a number of the things that this, this word talks about have been found, have been found to be absolutely 100% true. <clears throat> but we put all of our, all of our ducks in Google, in, in, in news, and all the ridiculousness that comes around it. There are people today that will stand up and say something and they will say, God told me to say it. And, and, and I look at that person and go, <clears throat> wait a minute. Weigh it against this. I've told everybody in this church before, anything you hear, you weigh it against this. You look for the scripture that validates it. Because everything that ha is true is validated here. It's validated here. <clears throat> this brings in the balance. So, in order to be set free, truth needs grace, and grace needs truth. Have you ever heard of the love crew? And I, and I found this interesting because I, I, I love to look at the way things are set into motion. And, and then, and then I, I go to the word of God and I start asking the Lord to show me by his word exactly if what I'm if what I'm hearing is true all right so there's the love crew all right and and you know actually you might fit into some of this all right as we speak about this because see the love crew is this all right you ready they're the ones that have separated grace from truth they want all the love but none of the truth so God loves everything about everyone. Last time I remembered, the word of God said that God hates sin. What is sin? Anything outside of the will of God. What is the will of God? That we would live in the place where what we do would please God. Now, what we have done, and I've said this before, is we classify sin. You have the sin of of thievery, the sin of murder, the sin of homosexuality, the sin of this, the sin of that. But then we look at those and we, we establish in our minds, in our humanity, that one sin is worse than the other. When that's not true, sin is sin is sin. All across the board, sin is an even thing. From stealing a candy bar to killing people, sin is sin. All right, now there's, there's degrees of sin, there's, there's degrees of sin that are a little bit worse, but in God's eyes, sin is sin. So, so the balance is when we live in the righteousness of Christ, 
we are set free by truth and grace. But when we don't and we begin to categorize things or we say, well, listen, God loves everything. Well, he does. I, I drove by something the other day and it said, God loves everything. And I went, not everything. God does not love sin. God does not love sin. God hates sin. And he hates what sin does to his children. And so he came up with the sacrifice that would create us to be able to cross from sin into righteousness. And that's Jesus Christ. But does that mean that all of a sudden we can just do whatever we want? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The word of God says we are to live holy. We are to live as Christ has called us to live, as the Father has called us to live. You know, you look at the law where all of a sudden every single thing that was done, you had to create a sacrifice for. You had to come up with a sacrifice for. And so what happens? People just went, well, might as well sin, got to kill something anyways. And so they just kept sinning. Look at the Israelites. How many times were they told by God, don't do this. This is what happens when you do this. And they continued to do it. Why? Because what's a bird? What's a goat? What's a cow? What's this? What's that? See? Now comes a life dependent on it. So when we sin, now we're saying that what God provided for us, oh well, he loves me. He'll love me all the time. Well, see, here's this other, there's another word that comes into play here. And and it's the word jealous. Because here, God is love, yes, but the balance is, is he is a jealous God. He's a jealous God who doesn't want to share his children with the world or with Satan. So so you've got the love crew that are, oh, it's all love. It's all love. God loves everything. No, he doesn't. He doesn't love everything. That's why there's the truth of his word and the grace of his word. It's, It's like this. When Jesus told a story, He told a story, and he applied grace to the story. What's grace? Unmerited favor. So grace came with the truth, and what happened? The grace taught the lesson, but the truth took the standard and said, this is how I want you to live. The grace of the the message was this. I'm giving you the opportunity to make the decision. Now, if you make the decision based on balance, which again means a sound mind, you will have an understanding of going, wow, he just told me exactly what was going to happen if I didn't do this. It's like like when you have a kid that doesn't want to eat, all right, and you sit down at the table and you say, okay, I know you, you know, the kid doesn't want to eat. Let's say lima beans, because I hate lima beans. All right, lima beans are disgusting. All right, it shouldn't even be in a food group. All right, but, but, but they do have some nutritional value. And, 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 you know, a lot of times, let me put it this way. God doesn't change the rules for one of his children. He holds us all accountable to the whole word of God to the whole written and the whole spoken word of God. He doesn't say, well, this is for Billy and this is for this. You know, one of the things in in my house that we had, Crystal and I, with with our kids growing up was, was this. The rules apply to every single kid. All right, so so you had your, your basic rules, all right? These were the rules that applied. They didn't change. They had to stay the same. Why? Because it created order and balance. And everybody knew that they were on the same playing field. We didn't change it because Billy Bob had a rough day. We may, we may have applied grace a little bit and been a little bit more lenient, but the rules never changed. God's word never changes from Genesis to Revelations. And I don't understand why we think we get the opportunity to change it. Because we don't. We don't. 
It was established, and in this established truth, with grace applied, that brings the balance into life. But when we separate grace from truth, what do we have? Well, you look at that sheet of paper. When we separate grace from truth, down in the right-hand corner, it says call out. All right? There's no grace. And in that no grace situation, what do we do? We point out other sins, but we don't look at ours. We look at the toothpick in our neighbor's eyes, but we forget to look at the telephone pole that's been firmly planted in ours. So we, we overpower others with our what? What we believe is our perfection. That call-out state does not express truth of Christ and does not bring anybody into righteousness. As a matter of fact, more than likely, it will drive people away. It will drive people away because it's all about the truth. There's no peace found in that, that particular perception, and there's no joy because what is, what is, what is a life that has truth and grace bring? Peace and joy. Peace and joy. I'll never forget the day somebody came up to me and they said, God loves you, but he hates what you're doing. And he's, a, he's, he's made a way for you. But you have to be able to step into that way. And, but when you step into that way, I'm going to tell you something. Things are going to be amazing. The truth is that you are not living towards God. You are not living for God. So I got truth and grace. The truth and the grace is what brought me to Christ. You're living as a sinner, but God's provided a way. And that way is Jesus Christ. And when you, when you walk in the way of the Lord, watch what happens. There's peace and there's joy. It's kind of funny. I, I, I walked into the camp office and, and, and the guy that, that, that hired me, Warren, goes, it never rains at Takahoe. I said, you're right, it never rains, but man, every day is like Christmas. Now, remember, this is a Jewish camp. Every day is like Christmas, and you never know what's in the box. And he goes, because, you know, they don't celebrate Christmas. And he goes, good analogy. He says, and you're smiling while you're saying it. I said, what, what is there to get upset over? You know, what, what, what can you change about it? Nothing. So you know what? You, you can't change this. You can't change this. So roll with it. Roll with it. Because fighting against it is going to create more ridiculousness in you. So when we live in low grace and high truth, which is truth with no grace, we end up turning people away from God. When we explicitly promote God as only love, we never let the truth permeate with grace. We never let the truth permeated with grace, and this is one of my words, with grace, do it work, catalysticking, motivated love based on truth. You like that? We want, we want the catalyst to stick. Fred's getting ready to write down. He's got my, my, Pastor Mark's dictionary of words. Catalyst sticking. All right? It's the, catalyst, it's the catalyst sticking motivated love based on truth. All right? Because that's what we want. We want the grace to do its work of teaching while truth permeated with that grace motivates us based on a love-based truth. Because listen, truth based in love is a lot easier to take than truth based without grace. Because if I got somebody doing this in my face, the first thing I want to do is break their finger. The second thing I want to do is do exactly what they say not to do. And that's how I was when I was a kid. Don't climb the tree. Okay. Climb the tree, fall out of the tree. Fall out of the tree, break things, 
get stuck with sticks in your body? Don't don't climb the tree. What do we what do we naturally want to do? We don't want to, we don't want to climb the tree. So when somebody associates the truth with this, what happens? Pff, I'm not going to listen to that. I don't need to. So see, that's where the joy is left. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's none of these things. Why? Because we're pointing out the sin. <clears throat> have you ever heard the statement, get a backbone or you don't have a backbone? Well, the truth of God has a backbone. The truth of the Lord has a backbone. And we nailed it to the cross. So there's a backbone in the word of God. Those who don't want to follow the word of God don't have a backbone. Because it takes guts to take a stand as a, as a believer. It takes guts to take a stand as a believer. You, you have to be able to stand tall, stand firm, and have a backbone to stand for God. But when you stand for God, the grace of God is poured out over you. Now let me keep going here. What if I told you you needed to begin to deal with your sin? Now I know what many of you are saying, but Pastor Mark, we're all Christians. Yes, that's true, but you, you have a sin nature. And I guarantee you today that on the way here, something came into your mind and you automatically had a thought that led directly to sin. Maybe somebody pulled out in front of you. Maybe, maybe you saw something on the side of the road and you had to make a comment about it. Maybe you saw somebody in the store this morning and you made a comment in your mind on how they were dressed. And it was a negative comment. That's sin. Right? That's sin. Honestly. Because, because why? Why? Because I've taken my sound mind and now I've allowed it to go crazy. And, and so, you know, I've said this before. I can't remember who it was. But he used to confess his sins on a quarterly time of day. Every quarter of the time of day, he would say, Lord, Father, forgive me. I can't let anything separate me from you. I know that I had these thoughts a little while ago. So, Father, forgive me, Lord Jesus. Apply your grace to me. Teach me how not to have those. I think it was D.L. Moody. Teach me not to have these thoughts because I don't want to be separated from the things that you have for me. He knew the importance of truth and grace. So the first thing, number one, is call out. The second is hang out. Now here's hang out. All grace. Everything is about grace. There's no truth. I know I know a hundred people or more that live primarily on grace and never want to tell you the truth. As a matter of fact, we just had a class on this. It's called I Don't Want to Offend Anybody. And there are churches all over the world today that live in this hangout area where they are looking to be able to keep people in comfort with no offense. They want to preserve peace. Not, not the peace that's found within the Lord, but emotional peace. They want to keep emotional peace. You know what emotional peace is? Oh, I don't want to get them upset. I want them to be able to just be stable. So, so what do we do? We, we just, we don't tell them, we don't tell them that they're living a little bit wrong. We don't tell them that, you know, they might want to think about going before God and seeking the correct answer. But it's just all about, oh, God loves you. God loves you. It's wrong. As a matter of fact, I got a couple other notes here. It's dwelling in love expressed not on the soul level, but on the emotional level. It destroys righteousness 
And it literally allows us to check out of the truth of God. So when I'm doing nothing but applying grace and not saying, you know, it's, it's like this. You want me to counsel you. I'm going to give you grace, but I'm also going to give you truth. Because honestly, the truth sets you free. And when grace becomes the catalyst for the truth, what happens? Man, there's the unending joy of the Lord that comes with it. Because if I'm just saying, oh, it's okay, God will love you, then, then I'm not helping you to come to terms with the fact that you are living in the place that God has not called you to be. So what am I doing? I, I'm creating an off-balance nature for you. Number one, the call out. Number two, our off-balance mindsets. They don't allow you to, to, to seek the righteousness of God because one turns you away and the other one says, oh, you're okay. You're okay. You're fine. I, 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 know, I know a person that constantly, oh, oh, it's okay. It's okay that they're doing this. It's okay because God still loves them. Yes, God loves them, but he's not happy. He's not happy. As a matter of fact, he's probably a little pissed off. But he's still going to love you. But what does is, what is the, what is the word of God say it says that happens when, when, when Jesus is not happy? He weeps. He weeps. He's angry, but he weeps. Why? Because he's a righteous God. He's a jealous God. You know, those people that don't think God is jealous are nuts. They're nuts. I have verses for all of this, by the way, and I'm going to get to them in a minute. Again, balance. We speak about all the things the world is doing, but in reality, we need to start looking at our life. Now, the word posture in the Greek is taxis. It means an arranging order, and I love that. It means an arranging order. There's an order that God set. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, Adam, man, and then Eve. That's the order of the Bible. All right? It's not, it, I can't find anywhere where it is changed. But the world is trying to change it constantly. Believers are trying to change it constantly. But the word of God says how it was. God created all things. God created Adam. Then he gave Adam Eve. But then, of course, Adam and Eve got out of a sound mind. And what did they do? They entered into sin. And then what happened? Sin became our nature. And then what happened? Jesus Christ was called by the Father. Hey, I got to put you in here above Adam because Adam's turned into a basket case and Adam can't figure things out, and he needs a sacrifice. He needs a provision. He needs a payment. He needs all these things that only you can give him. That's grace. That's grace. Instead of just saying, like, like the Lord did in the first place, I'm just going to flood it, kill them all, and start over. I, I, very easy for God to do, but is there balance in that? No. There's no balance. And I'm pretty sure God... I just flooded the whole earth that I created and wiped everybody out. Wow, there's no that just makes me look mean. I have to have a balance. Son, you're going to be my balance. See? There's a balance. By the way, turn to 1 Corinthians 14:40. Because in order to stand in the posture of the balance of God, it takes discipline. To have, to have a mind like we spoke of earlier takes discipline. So turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Very last one. It says this. 
Likewise, there are bodies made for the heavens and bodies made for the earth. The heavenly bodies have a different kind of glory or luminescence compared to bodies below. Is that where I wanted to go? No. That's not where I wanted to go. No, 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 no. I was looking for 1 Corinthians 14.40. Hmm. Yeah, okay. It takes balance. All right, it takes balance. I, I, I was in the wrong Bible when I was studying the other night. It takes balance. All right, it says this. It says it so well. For balance... Just maintain the proper order in all things. In other words, all things decently and in order. All things decently and in order. So, so when we take this and we apply too much of this, then this becomes out of balance. If we apply truth without grace, it becomes out of balance. We have the call out and we have the hangout. Pretty soon we're going to check the checkout. Now, in the hangout area, it takes too much energy. It takes too much energy to maintain all the grace and no truth. Because when there's no truth, that means we, ha we have to do everything correctly by grace. And you can't do that. Because how can you fix what's, what's broken if nobody's telling you the truth? You can't. You can't. You have to be... When Jesus sat there and he, looked, and he looked at his disciples and he said, look, as a matter of fact, when he, when he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because Peter was telling him, this isn't what you're going to do. Peter wanted to apply all grace, no truth. The truth of the matter was, is Jesus came to die for the sins of humanity. But Peter's saying, oh, no, 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 not you. See, Peter was all about the grace. Not about the truth. The truth was that Jesus was going to die. It takes too much energy to live there. And so what happens? So we check out. We check out. Now we have low grace and low truth. But to maintain proper order in our lives... We must be in balance. Not as you understand them, but as they are written and spoken. Because as we see most of the times, all right, and, and you have to understand this, when we're not thinking in the correct mindset and we're not in that place of balance, what happens? Most of the time, our interpretations of the word of God are fictional. Makes sense. Now, I'm going to tell you a word in a minute that literally shows you this. All right? And you're going to be shocked when I tell you what this word is in the Greek. Now, if we look in Hebrews... We can see the balance of grace when we speak about Melchizedek. But we're not going to speak about Melchizedek today. We're going to save that for another time because I'm going to do a series on the order of Melchizedek. Because as I was reading that, it was very fascinating. Very fascinating. But I'm not going to speak on that today. Turn to Colossians 2 with me for a minute. Colossians 2 verse 1 says, This battle I am facing is huge, and I want you to know I do it for you. For all those at Laodicea and for everyone else, even those who have never seen my face. I'm working hard to comfort and encourage them so that they will be knit together. 
that many hearts would become one through his love. I do it so they will be rich in understanding and have full knowledge of God's mystery, which is the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. In him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are concealed. I can... I only tell you this to warn you about those who would try and deceive you, deceive you with their arguments. They seem plausible enough, but in the end, they are false. Even though I cannot be there in the body, my spirit is with you, and I'm happy to know of your good order and your solid commitment to Jesus Christ, our King. <clears throat> the next word that we pull from the Greek word taxis is tasso. Now, tasso means drawn up and determined. So here's what happens. Do you want to know who throws God's word out of balance? Those that want grace over truth. I love John 1.14. Turn there for a minute. Bill. I'm going to pull this all together in a minute. John 1, 14. It says, The Word took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside of us. We have seen him enveloped in undeniable splendor, the one true Son of the Father, evidenced in the perfect balance of evidenced in the perfect balance of grace and truth. You, you know, I, I love it because Jesus came and he brought truth. But his truth had a balance of grace. Now, without that balance, without truth and without grace, we go to checkout. Checkout is survival mode. Um, most people would call it retreat or rest. Or most people would call it rest, but it's really retreat. There is no righteousness. There is no joy. And it is, it is a joyless magnet. Most people give up completely in the checkout mode because they have been given no truth and no grace. So they don't have an understanding. As a matter of fact, it is not... It is not the rest of Christ that refreshes, all right, in the checkout place. You know, it's like, oh, I, you know, I had somebody say this to me once. I need a break from church. Why? I, I just need to get my head straight. I said, are you kidding me? I said, what is there to straighten out apart from understanding the truth that sets you free when it's applied with grace? I, I just need to check. I need to, I just, I need a break. Oh, okay. I'll be back. It's been two and a half years. I haven't seen them come back. It is a, in the checkout place, it is a non-love culture. It is a non-love culture. Well, I love them all, but I need to go. <laughs> You, in other words, you're checking out. You check, you're checking out of the whole thing. All right? It, it's, it's interesting because we see a lot of missionaries. They'll come out of Bible college, and a lot of missionaries will come, come out of Bible college with seven-foot flames coming off. It's like they are on fire. They are going to change the world. And then within a two-year period of time, because they, they've, they've, they've drank in the Kool-Aid, They've drank in the Kool-Aid. And, and I'm saying this, I, I know many of them that have come out of Bible college and within two years I've checked out completely. Because what they weren't told was the truth. And they weren't given the truth in grace. You can do it all with Jesus. You can do it all with Jesus. But you have to do it in the balance of Christ. See? I remember somebody once said to me, Oh, you can go and do this. And I went, oh. and, and literally, literally, I began to believe them. 
And we almost moved to Russia, didn't we? Crystal goes, no, we weren't going to move to Russia. Because I, I came out of, I came out of something. I said, we're going to Russia. We're going to be Russian missionaries. And Crystal went, no, we're not. <laughs> I went, oh. I said, Lord, are you sure that was right? You know what the Lord told me? He said, no, nah, that wasn't right. He says, you, 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 you bought it without the truth. Yes, you can do all things through me, but only when I give you the direction to go and do it. There's a balance. There's a balance. Now a lot of Bible colleges are getting a lot better at balance. Now call out, hang out, and check out are all created in our own strength. They're all out of balance. They are all cultures of the flesh. They're all cultures of the flesh. Jesus is graceful, graciously truthful and truthfully gracious. When it's not balanced, what happens? We lead people into the shadows and parodies of grace and truth. Now, the word parody in the Greek, you're going to find this interesting, means Beelzebul. Does anybody want to take a guess who Beelzebul is? That's Satan. The name of the chief of evil spirits. So when we lead people, when we lead people into an unbalanced place, we lead people into the shadows and parodies of grace and truth. We lead them into the darkness of evil. So, so it's, it's really kind of interesting because I've said this before. I've said these two words, three words, discern the spirit. And, 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 and you know, a lot of people say, well, what does that mean, Pastor Mark? Right here. Right here. You're getting it now. When I discern the spirit, I am not going to allow the enemy to bring me into an unbalanced situation of an unsound mind that is going to take me and lead other people into that same place. When, I, I remember one day somebody said to me, and they said, I never study the word of God. I let the Holy Spirit or I let the Spirit speak through me. I go, what? They said, the Spirit just speaks through me. I said, wait a minute. The word of God says to study to find yourself approved. What is it, what you're saying is that whatever pops into your head, you believe is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and you're telling people about it. Now, now, this person, all right, literally is leading people in the, into the parodies of darkness because what he's saying is not even close to being correct. Now, the reason I know this is because every time he goes on Facebook, there is a hundred people blasting him with scripture that disproves him. So it's interesting that as we do not apply the balance of the word of God, which happens with believers when we don't mix truth and grace in an even balance and we introduce people to the call out stage, the hangout stage or the checkout stage, we are literally leading them into the places of parodies of darkness. And who lives in darkness? The enemy lives in darkness. And what happens in an unbalanced mind? The enemy has a field day. Remember, John 1:14 says, Jesus is graciously balanced. In truth, the word is balanced in truth and grace. The next word is prototemai. It means to set something beforehand to achieve a particular purpose. When we are not in the balance of mind, heart, and soul, we are out of balance. And in an out of balance mindset, we lead people astray. 
we lead people astray. Now, go to the go to the call-in place on your paper. The call what? Um, that is parody. Now, in the call-in, which means the call-in place, we empower others. If you notice, everything else was overpowering others, disempowering others, and withholding the power for ourselves. Now we are empowering others. How? Because we have a balance of grace and a balance of truth. We have high grace and high truth. It is, it is motivated by the catalyst of grace. As a matter of fact, it's radical grace. It's radical grace and it's telling truth it is, it is, it is truth telling, truth listening, and truth living. All right, it's living in truth. It's speaking truth, and it's listening in truth. It is preparation for the divine nature. It is the preparation for living in the divine nature of God. It grace increases correction. Can't read that far away. Truth allows, truth lets people, or truth, hold on here, I had to write a letter, little, Let me see if I can. It's the truth seeing people as God sees them. So when we, when, we, when we have high grace and high truth, it allows us to see people as God sees them, not as we see them. All right, now, you know, if a guy came in here and he was, I'm going to, I'll use this. Some of you guys met my friend Mike. Mike, Mike uh, was a surfer that came up here two years ago uh, to visit Mad Dog was what we called him. Mike was a good friend of ours. We kind of adopted him in Old Orchard Beach. He showed up one day uh, barefoot with a skateboard and a guitar strapped on his back, a bathing suit and no shirt. And, and he went, Mom, Dad, I'm home. And, and it was really kind of interesting. And so we, we, all, we just took him in. Mike became like one of us. Most people looked at Mike and went, he's a bum. Mike didn't work. Mike surfed. He did odd jobs. He lived in the back of a pickup truck. M Mike, when we met him, was not a Christian, but he was a child of God. Mike had long hair, hadn't bathed in a few days, took a shower up back under our hose. It was cool. A as we got to know Mike, we began to apply grace and truth to Mike. We, we never once said, Mike, you know, this is, you know, but Mike would wander in at you know noontime, one o'clock in the afternoon when we would open the doors for the house of David, and he'd reek a little bit about stale beer because Mike used to go from one end of the beach to the other end of the beach at night, play music, and get beer. That's what Mike did. Now, along this two-month period of time in the summer, we loved Mike in the grace and truth of Christ. Fred was there. Crystal was there. We fed Mike, um, and, and Mike, Mike would sing. But Mike got the truth with grace. And in the balance of truth and grace, Mike got saved. And Mike gave his life to Christ. And does that make Mike a perfect human being? No. It makes Mike now a sinner saved by grace. And the grace of the Lord was covering, was put over the precipice of sin and unrighteousness. And so the balance of grace and truth led Mike to the Lord. We empowered Mike to make a decision based on the truth of the word of God. Mike has become an amazing servant of Christ. And, and, and in the meantime, Mike, Mike met, I can't remember her name now, Jennifer. Mike met Jennifer, all right? And, and, and Mike and Jennifer became boyfriend and girlfriend. All right, and, and Mike brought Jennifer up here. And, and we said, you can't stay in our house because you're not married. Again, 
As for me and my house, we will follow the ways of the Lord. It's what we do. And Mike said, I understand, Mark. That's what the word of God says. I understand you're a man of God, and, and I understand. He goes, I, I'm trying to work on this. I said, Mike, I understand. But I have to be, I have to be correct with God. So, so Mike got, got a place in Old Orchard Beach or wherever. But it's really kind of interesting because in that whole thing, we got to meet Jennifer. And what happened? Jennifer got gloriously saved here in this chapel. So now we've got Jennifer who we've led to the Lord because of the grace and truth of the word of God, the balance. And in the balance of grace and truth, Jennifer now is going on. She, her and Mike are not together. All right, because she said, Mike, you're, you don't want to make a commitment to me. So you know what? I, I can't stay with you. And so what does she do? She's now going all over the place as a missionary. She's got a real estate license. She, she, she goes here and there and everywhere. What? Ministering God's truth and grace to what? Other people. We gave her what Christ had for. That, that's the call in place. That call in place empowers other people to walk forward in grace and truth with God. You see? It's not all grace which doesn't give them the truth and allows them to keep living stupidly in an unbalanced situation. It doesn't just ram truth down their throat so they don't have an understanding of grace which drives them away. It doesn't put them in a checkout phase where they go, oh, I can't do this. No, it empowers them to make a decision to based on truth, based on grace, not on a parody, but to make a decision to what? Go forward with God. And in that going forward with God, they find their identity. Living in the reality of who Jesus Christ is. And they find joy. And in that, they find lasting relationships. Lasting relationships. It's, it's awesome to be in the call out place, place because there's connecting, there's empathizing, there's a maintenance of boundaries. You are called into a relationship. There's responsibility, and I love this the most. There's celebration. There is celebration. I'm telling you, I wake up every morning and I, and I creak and I groan and I snap, crackle, and pop. And I go, hallelujah, God. I am so glad I'm alive this morning. It's a, Yahoo! It's a celebration. Because you know what? I never know. Like I said, I never know what God's going to bring to me. I never know what God is going to have me doing. But I do know that he has empowered me through grace and truth to make a decision based on the reality of facts to go forward with him. See, that's the cool thing. I don't have to go in a false premise of what God's word says because reality tells me that he loves me, that he will always love me, and that he has given me eternal life from the moment I said, yes, Father, I am yours and you are mine. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. <clears throat> Lord, we just come before you, Father, and we thank you, Lord. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would just take this time, Father, and allow this message to just permeate our hearts, Father. Lord, us, Lord, allow us to have an understanding of your truth and grace in a balanced posture. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Father, I'm so glad that the people that talked to me had a balance of grace and truth, Father. And that in that balance, Father, your, your joy, your celebration, your righteousness, your responsibility were all there out front. Father, I'm so glad I got to make a decision to live balanced by your word. Father, today as we go, Lord, I'm just asking, Father, that you would help us to live in the balance of your word, Father. Keep the parodies of falsity away, Father. Another word I know. 
Just keep those away, Father. Don't allow us to be distracted, Father, by those things, Lord, that distract us. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Father, in your precious name we pray. Father, be with us as we go. Keep us cool. Amen and amen. You are dismissed.